I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar series of the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, the CSIAC. Today's presentation is entitled Deep Dive into the Dark Web. My name is Steve Warzala, and I am the CSIAC Outreach Manager. A few administrative notes before we begin today. Uh, first, all phones have been muted except for the presenters. Uh, questions may be asked at any time during the presentation by utilizing the chat function. And time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Uh, today's briefing slides will be posted on our website within a, a few days. And finally, I'd, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC. The funding that DTIC provides enables CSIAC to conduct these webinars. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Mr. Lance James. Uh, Lance currently serves as the Chief Scientist at Flashpoint, where he helps guide research and engages in thought leadership. Previously, he was the Head of Cyber Intelligence at Deloitte. Uh, Mr. James is a well-known information security specialist with over 15 years of experience in a wide range of areas, including programming, network security, digital forensics, malware research, cryptography design, cryptanalysis, counterintelligence, and protocol exploitation. Uh, credited with the identification of Zeus and other w malware, uh, Lance is an active contributor to the evolution of security practices and counterintelligence tactics and strategies. Uh, Mr. James was the founding force behind uh, CryptoLocker Working Group, where he and his team of researchers were acknowledged for their critical role in disrupting CryptoLocker as part of an FBI-led takedown operation. I'll turn the presentation over to Mr. James now. Uh, good afternoon, Lance. The, uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> so um, <clears throat> um, I, I know I can't see everybody, but I uh, hope everybody is out there is having a great day today. Um, I'm going to get started here with uh, Deep Dark Dive Dark into the Web. Um, uh, we kind of had introductions, um, so I can kind of move on from that. Thank you for the introduction, by the way. Um, so we're going to kind of focus on the actual business model of the underground. So. In, 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 our, in, in my daily life that I, I deal with, um, you know, we kind of have to deal with like all of these badness coming out of people. And then organizations, they see it on the other end when they get either hit or, or they deal with some kind of hack or, or some kind of fraud. <clears throat> so we're kind of going to go step back and have it more of the view of how, they, uh, how, how their business model works so that you can kind of understand what you're, uh, the adversary here. What's ironic with this picture is that is it is not much different than the businesses we run on our end all day to, uh, as well. Um, so, um, excuse me. Um, so basically, it starts kind of like a kingpin or a CEO in that sense, uh, and then they have both an operational side and a f uh, finance side. Um, they have technically a product manager that manages pretty much like senior developers, UI, uh, making sure that the, the malware or the, the, the tools that they write uh, are not uh, getting seen by, uh, you know, antivirus uh, services, so like there's an obfuscation. And they also have QA, like uh, testing. Um, even getting funnier is they also have like loader devs for exploits. So for, uh, on the exploit R&D side, they have actual bot developers and loader developers and people that focus on making sure that these pieces of malware or these botnets get into your computers. Um, and then there's the side of it where people go from that, the operation side into the botnet master, the people who actually manage the botnets themselves. Now this can also be, their, uh, if they rent them out, this can be a separate group of individuals, but they're s uh, spread out as like, almost like an affiliate or a, or a partner, right? And the botnet master basically focuses around resiliency, analytics, and, and b making relations. So uh, bulletproof hosting providers out there, people that are kind of like, uh, on our end, we would think of Akamai or Cloudflare as well. They're looking at, um, you know, things similar to that. Uh, analytics, uh, tracking down who got hit, who didn't, what's the best entry point. Uh, is it a Windows 7 uh, system or is it, uh, you know, Windows 8 and 10 with this running Internet Explorer or did it hit better with Chrome? It keeps all the statistics. Uh, as well as affiliate re relations, which is pretty much your partnerships. How do you get the traffic in? And they work with, like, ad brokers and SEO, black hat SEOs and spammers. Uh, and traffic brokers and hijackers, people that have hijacked accounts already and, and, and they sell persistence or activity inside. A good example of this was when CryptoLock was coming out, 
it, uh, it, it, it was actually, they bought uh, or had an affiliate relationship with the Zeus Gamer over folks that already had the infected accounts and then pushed their product through that, getting a high guarantee, a high conversion rate. So, um, so the, the key for uh, defeating threats is information sharing uh, in that sense. Right? On our side, we have many uh, initiatives, CISA and ISO, we have NCFTA. Um, the ironic part is, uh, another irony, is the criminals share information to de defeat us all the time, but they do it in a much quicker fashion. They, when we think of forums, we need to think more like it's like platforms. They have their platforms, we have our platforms. Um, for some reason, they tend to get theirs up faster and, it, and people use them quickly. Um, but basically, uh, they, they, they focus around uh, defeating us by sharing information and staying in tune with what the latest uh, way or, or uh, arms race is to get around uh, certain things. Uh, the question about information superiority, superiority is who does have the uh, upper hand, do we or do them? Obviously, uh, criminals communicate openly behind like password walls, technically we do too, um, but um, their division of labor uh, in information sharing increases the efficiency. They don't have the NDAs to sign, they don't have all of those things. Um, you know, so, so that, that becomes a, 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 you know, um, a bit of a challenge for us to, to fight back, and so we seem a lot slower, uh, so they're a lot more agile than we are. Um, so when we look at those information sharing lines uh, along the lines of operation, we can kind of break it down to like development and finance. Like earlier we were talking about operations finance. So uh, there's different forums out there such as like, you know, Exploit, uh, Kuru, Maza, Wasm, and AntiChat that focus on development of exploits, malware, uh, and, and tools that you can actually use to gain uh, uh, financial gain basically. And so then on the other side we have the Carter forums, the places where they trade financial information which is like verified, Karofka, direct connection, monopoly, infra. Think of this on the one side is as if we had DevOps or software houses that actually provided us the tools and technologies. On the other side, these are the, the trading platforms, the banks and the trading platforms that actually uh, run those tools and then uh, you know, work and, and uh, you know, basically they use uh, those platforms to basically trade information. So it's not much different than we uh, are here. Uh, we see ourselves here, it's just it's in a darker world. So. Um, so how this actually kind of becomes, there's a feedback loop with organized crime and lone actors. So you're wondering how, some people wonder, well, how did this all suddenly get to an explosion level? You know, it kind of started all out and like we heard about it in 2002, 2003 with phishing and hitting major banks and suddenly all, everything's the tables turn and people are wondering what's going on. But when we kind of think about it, how is it literally feeding into itself and, 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 and growing so rapidly? So and the interesting thing about it is, is on a forum, right, um, you'll find some enterprise thinking uh, person that wants to recruit developers from within a forum. In many of these countries, uh, you kind of have to realize that they, um, the, the labor is different there. It's not necessarily always available easily or it's, it's harder. Some of the jobs are economically, uh, some of the countries are having economic trouble. So the enterprise then recruits the developer from within a forum. The developer says, yes, please hire me, right? So the developer produces a product for this enterprise, right? And then they go out and sell it. But then as soon as the developer realizes, wait, I don't really have, you know, an illegal NDA. This is crime, right? We, we, I'm going to resell the same product back into the forum myself. Why don't I make the money, right? So basically what will happen is, is that, you know, the developers then start becoming back into the loop and they become the enterprise, right? And, and this loop is a lot faster than you know, a 10, 15 year career growth uh, that, that usually spans someone maybe who's been developing for years and it becomes a CTO or a VP of engineering. This happens very, very quickly. Um, you know, the syndicates out there and they hire and buy on the forums, uh, the TTPs and products they develop, uh, syndic syndicates are sold and then the division of labor uh, lowers barriers to entry for these would-be criminals. So they just quickly become their own enterprise. Uh, and so this is why we're getting a plop of clusters of just literally exponentially uh, expanding very quickly. So another thing that we've seen on some of the, the trends here is um, since 2011, we looked at, um, I believe the RSA breach was one of the eye-opening pieces of uh, sophisticated attacks. Uh, and it was what we considered an advanced persistent threat or an advanced persistent attack. And it was, you know, subsized to be a nation state actor. It was very sophisticated. It went after crypto specific tokens. Uh, they knew exactly what they were going to do with that information. Most other people, most of the common Criminal is not going to even know about that. But what's happened is that when you also look at the previous pattern, the common criminal, the organized cr criminal, was doing serial patterns. That is, serial campaigns such as phishing, where they just send every two weeks a load of phishing and slam everybody with a big bulk mailing list and, and um, you know, see what they can collect, opportunistic, whereas the other one is obviously persistent and focused. 
But what's happened is since 2011, because we've seen the nation state and the advanced persistent threat, the media has kind of helped produce a lot of the, uh, the noise there. The organized criminals have realized, hey, that's what I want too. They're succeeding because the difference with RSA was that the, 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 they were in those systems for over 11 months. So obviously, why would I want to do a serial campaign if I can do also get in these systems and you know, control the entire network and get all the money I want? So as we've seen that, you've obviously seen with the target breaches and the different other breaches that are going on, uh, this has shifted over. So organized crime has gone from serial campaigns, which they still apply, but then they've also basically bridged over to the techniques of an advanced persistent threat. So the identification of an advanced persistent threat today becomes a lot more grouped up and you can't necessarily decide whether it's a Russian criminal organization, a Chinese criminal organization, or a Chinese or Russian government. And so that becomes uh, a very interesting. Also cyber insurgencies such as and hacktivists such as anonymous things like that or, or a Syrian electronic army sometimes have deployed tactics um, you know, very, you know, that can uh, gain persistence and are more targeted. So that's actually an evolving method of attack that we're seeing across the board. Um, one of the other things that kind of look at is, like I said earlier, it's not really about forums anymore. It's about crimeware as a service, right? So everything is done, okay, so the tools that we use, for instance, some people use Elasticsearch behind the engine of some of their search engines and, and platforms. Some people use Kafka for messaging. Some people have AWS. They have all these different pieces and stuff. The bad guys are literally using the same sets of architecture and tools that we do as well, right? Um, some of the bot shops out there uh, are managed uh, heavily on like Elasticsearch so that they're fast and they're robust and that you can search for information on marketplaces. Um, this is actually one of the reasons why some of the marketplaces have been coming up very quickly, right? So these turnkey services, you can't really think about them as like, you know, you have marketplaces and forums, but really they're just platforms nowadays. They're, pla you know, criminal platforms as a service. And a lot of times you also start seeing that they're offering platforms to sell to other people to build as a platform. Again, that, uh, that lucrative e enterprise uh, thinking. But like we'll have bot shops and you know, every kind of one-stop shops where you can get your, SNA, uh, your social security numbers, your digital goods, uh, your domains that you may need for a heist. Um, you, know, you can get everything, all your bots, and you can have them control them, everything like this. And it's, it's all kind of commoditized now, right? So, so buying into to getting into being criminal uh, a lot of people think that they like to make a lot of money, but it also with commodity comes you know lower tier pieces where they'll make some money, but it's not going to be the millions. It's very rare the millions that you see that sometimes get out. So <clears throat> um, another trend that we're seeing is because of the chip and pin movement, uh, we're also seeing uh, a combination of both um, attack uh, dis uh, discussions about chip and pin. How can we do this software things like that that are written out there? But we're also seeing an aggressive uh, POS malware trend. And the reason why is things are moving over to the chip. Uh, so they want to actually be able to hack the POS, whether it's got chip or pen. But they're adding features. And we're seeing people say, I've got a new one, and, and it looks pretty. But they also add us on the side. They have one on this one here, this, this POS malware called Fatal. Uh, it has air gap uh, uh, control. So if they cannot get on the internet, it, it has techniques that may be able to find a ways to actually be able to send or channel that information out when it does, which means like the time it may do a queue and send something out if it's a single use POS, it may be able to find out a way to carry itself um, uh, and get out of the air gap so that it can actually, uh, you can communicate back to it. Um, a lot of different other features here. Uh, it's all about simplifying. It's no different than the businesses that we run this today. So we want to high, have, have lots of features and uh, a very easy interface, user interface. Um, <clears throat> ransomware. So uh, the ransomware evolution has been very, very, very interesting. Since the crypto locker um, ransomware, it has set a, 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 p a piece in motion. And I think honestly, there was a lot of luck in getting the, ran the crypto locker taken down. Uh, there were some mistakes made and things like this, but it was one of the first to introduce, it was the first, to introduce asymmetric use of asymmetric encryption, which is public keys and private keys, which is something that the security research community has been worried about for more than five or six years, or even five or six years before CryptoLocker. We thought it would happen sooner, uh, and it finally happened. Um, the interesting pieces also, which makes these hard, is that they're using, usually the advanced ones are using native cryptography libraries, the same libraries that you use for BitLocker or FileVault are also the same crypto libraries they use for this. So blocking it by the crypto library will not work. Um, the public key in this case encrypts the data, which then basically they have the secret key. 
Um, and so that it makes it very difficult unless you get into the actual servers themselves, which they're hosted around multi-tier resilient infrastructures, meaning we've literally watched tier one is one proxy set, and then there's a whole loop of tier twos, which is another proxy, and then maybe tier three you get to actually where the server is, which is hidden somewhere in multiple countries that are specifically designed to be very hard to, um, to extradite or get ac access to. Um, and many of them are moving into Bitcoin pay payment. We also see other things such as money pack and uh, things like that, but everything's kind of moving over to Bitcoin, which is also making it very difficult. I've literally seen letters written to, or like emails written to the, uh, the ransomware owners saying, I'm a mom, I, I have three kids, I have a job, this is my job computer, I'm going to lose my job, I don't even know how to use Bitcoin, please help me, and, and I, I, you know, things like that. And sometimes they'll bargain for even lower prices, like, you know, I can't afford the $300, can, you know, can I do 200 things like this. So it's really put people in a bind, but also the difficulty of them understanding what just happened. As much as there's been you know, on the news, a lot of people are still very, very surprised about what's going on. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, we're seeing more and more targeting towards other countries, not just the U.S. and Canada and England, but we are seeing more in those hot spots uh, to make a quick buck, uh, such as Spain and uh, Europe uh, specifically. So. Um, the resilient network is very interesting. Um, some of the techniques that they're using is called, uh, one of them is called domain generation algorithm, which is uh, designed for them to be able to maintain the system without having us shut it down. So it would generate 1,020 domains, um, random domains, random looking domains with different uh, top level domain uh, TLDs such as net, biz, ru, org, co, uk. Uh, and it'll generate 1,020 of those a day, and then basically it'll generate the ones next day. And maybe three or four or five of them have uh, been registered uh, for that for the next day. So, and it'll use obviously the ones previous to it uh, while it's, they're still alive, right? So this is a, an idea to keep it autonomous for the whole year. Um, but it's also the kryptonite. Uh, many of these things can be reverse engineered, which we did, which we did with CryptoLocker as an example. And what we did is then send the entire uh, block list to, to out to the community as well as um, you know, the industry so that they can basically have it where if they got infected, they would know it would block the actual public key from coming down. They would be infected, but at least their files wouldn't be encrypted. So this has been kind of a thing where obviously they evolve and, and see that we do that. Um, but this has been one of their kryptonites uh, as well because we can pretty much register all of these domains in a year ahead of time and they'd have to go back to their code, forcing them to actually increase complexity, change their, their random gen number generator and then basically do it again. And if we keep doing that, you, you tire the human out, which is the, the key to, to killing the malware supply chain. So also due to the fact that the D DGAs we can take over, uh, it allows us to seek or understand the internals of a botnet themselves. So, and who's infected. Um, <clears throat> also, some very interesting recent ransomware evolution. Some of the posts that we've seen in Russia, that we, we translated from, this, from Russia, from Russian. So, um, one of them says, good afternoon. I am in need of a code audit for a crypto locker. It needs to be tested for strength of encryption and possible holes. Written in Delphi, private message me for payment and contact details. Um, there's another message uh, from the same author. Uh, we developed the crypto locker. The crypto locker now, by the way, is the the trademark name for any ransomware now, so they call them crypto lockers. Um, we developed the crypto locker from scratch, RSA plus 768. We're planning to increase the length of the key, but there are other possible security vulnerabilities. This is why we need the audit. Ironically, the 768, it does make it weak, um, but I thought that was rather funny. Uh, also, key requirements, the person must be fluent in English and have lived in the US, must know and understand the American mentality. I think I'll take the job. So um, basically what's very interesting about the side of it is just like, just like us in our businesses, heck, maybe they're going to do it better. Sometimes we don't ask for security early enough in, in, on the industry side, but um, their security is an investment and security serves the business. And their investment and their goal is to develop the perfect ransomware. So obviously they're putting out there that they need people to be inspecting and knowing their, their crypto and making sure they're doing it right. Now, for a fact, Tesla Crypt, which just basically closed down shop and actually released the master decryption key, uh, for some reason uh, many people are still wondering about. Um, that was the most advanced uh, ransomware I've ever seen. Uh, it was using elliptic curve Diffie Hellman. It was using, uh, it was doing crypto in an exceptional way, aka that crypto, uh, you know, the crypto, the way they did it was done exceptionally well for, and, and surprisingly well and highly sophisticated. Uh, they knew what they were doing. Um, and obviously most of the hopes is people don't have uh, too many of those. For some reason that one's shut down. But we see the two most uh, advanced ones now, well, the, that one now gone, uh, Tesla Crypt, and then Crypto Wall was the second most advanced. 
Um, so another part of the ransomware that's very interesting for, for further evolution and defense is thick client ransomware. Basically, instead of, so as we mentioned earlier, when we were able to block the, the proxy, uh, we would basically put the domain generation algorithm into your proxies. It would block the key from coming down from encrypting the, 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 the actual files. You'd know that there was ransomware, but it would actually, if you block those domains, it would uh, you know, block that key. So what they've done to fight against that is some of ransomware comes with public keys embedded, like uh, the one that I was looking at has three embedded, um, and there was no remote server required to encrypt. So it doesn't have to connect out to encrypt, which is kind of trying to solve their air gap problem or at least any of the, the blocking problems. RSA crypto seems to be the gold standard. What I do see a lot of uh, people doing those, uh, the, the lower tiered ones are done with 768-bit keys. You get a set of GPUs and a Gaussian number field sieve, uh, you, you should be okay. Um, but um, it, it's still a big headache. Obviously, they're evolutionizing. The, one of the biggest things, the FBI and themselves have said that they are concerned with this as one of the biggest uh, threats because the price is low, the barrier to entry is easy, uh, and, it's, and, the, and the market uh, of infection is very, very high. Um, you know, and obviously, future concerns could be IoT, such as refrigerators. We don't want our, our, our beer getting warm and them holding it for hostage, that's for sure. So, um, going to come a step back a little bit. So, when we're kind of looking at the deep and dark web, I want others to be able to understand how to actually, you know, uh, get a handle on it. There's a lot of people that call me up and say, hey, how do I get started on the deep and dark web? How do I, where do I start? You know, uh, they've all been in intelligence before and, and they've worked in this. So I kind of figured let's put together something that uh, like, kind of makes sense to their, their speaking world. A lot of people that ask me have been ex-military, human work, uh, and this is just an extension of that. It's just on the platform of cyber. When I say cyber, cyber is a domain. So when I say domain, I mean land, air, space, sea, cyber, right? So, uh, so when I use the word cyber, I'm specifically referring to the domain that this is. But it does, it's just a domain. It's still there's a lot of kinetic action. But basically, let's talk about how to build an actual action plan around, like, uh, you know, handling uh, and, and dealing with adversaries. So when you go in the deep and dark web, you are looking at, uh, you know, the planners, the, the people that are actually, you know, building this out. And, and, and this can give you a high advantage, high advantage against I saw it after the fact or we just got hit with malware. And if you can piece those two together, you can be on top of malware six months before they finish designing it, right? For instance, we showed you the ransomware request uh, on the audit reviews. Well, that's before they finish writing this. So obviously, you know, knowing how to, to, to keep an eye on those kind of things is a big thing. So what we've done is we take the intelligence life cycle. Uh, we kinda, so we have basically, I kind of convert it to requirements slash planning and direction, which is you build out your requirements, which is basically your prioritized intelligence requirements is what's your focus going to be, right? So over here we have analysts that focus on Middle East and Northern Africa, Iran, uh, hacktivism, you know, nation state, you know, um, uh, China, the different things. Some of them have languages, this and that. So you kind of have to make sure that, you know, you, you know, your analysts have kind of like a feel out on, on the requirements, right, and, and what their requirements are and where do these requirements end up going. Then you build out kind of a planning and direction, which is like your mission, right. Um, from that point, you, once you have that, you kind of start going and, and building out the collections team, right. So you have a full collections team focused on that. And then processing, uh, and some in the military term, they also call it exploitation, but in, in business terms, we'll just call it processing, but processing uh, and making use of that data, right. Um, uh, and also after that, basically, we go to the, to the move to analysis and production. It did not become intelligence until it gets to analysis. Otherwise, it's just information. When you look at threat feeds today, those are just information uh, until they're actually analyzed. So, uh, and then from that point, how are you delivering it or the dissemination? One of the things that has to come back to that and, uh, is then also a feedback mode, which goes back to your requirements. So, a very important process is your dissemination of feedback. Well, how do you, you know, do an after event? How did we do with that and how did we uh, handle that incident or after event? Just like you do in an incident response or even in development where you do kind of a, a retrospective. Um, so what this gets you though is your focus will be to identify the adversary and their operational framework. So when we look through all this stuff, when you're going in the forums, we don't want to just go, oh, this forum, we know about it. We have to start honing into what we're looking at and who they are and how they're connected. We sync those collections uh, information with priority intelligence requirements. Is it uh, MENA? Is it, uh, you know, is it focused on China? Is it focused on uh, Russian underground malware? Things like that. So we have, and then we chart those key indicators uh, together. Are we going to see, you know, this malware coming out? Is this coming out? This and that. So when you collect this kind of intelligence, you need to put all those key indicators that we find, such as earlier we're talking about ransomware and the the the, the 768-bit keys and then the public key. 
uh, embedded. Those are key indicators that, that will give you predict, predictive insights into evolu uh, to, to, to understanding uh, what may be coming in front of you and what you need to kind of guard up for. Um, building a threat intelligence team is uh, it's, it's not an easy endeavor, but I wanted to kind of go into that so that it's not just about the deep and dark web, but also understanding how to manage the deep and dark web. Your goal should be, your mission should be proactive in nature. Uh, a threat research team needs, their main focus is to gain adversary understanding. Um, uh, you know, you're asking yourself when you think about threat indicators, what do they indicate? We see IOCs all the time when people think about hashes and malwares, but that, does that really indicate anything? Does that give you an answer or does it just tell you, okay, that's how to defend? Those are operational indicators, but when we think about it, let's talk about something more about like, what, what do they indicate, meaning motivation? What's the level of intensity and degree of focus of your adversary? What is the objective? They're boasting rights, disruption, destruction, learn secrets, do they make money? So m think about it from a money ideology, coercion, or ego, which is called MICE. Um, timeliness, how quickly they work, years, months, days, hours, how fast are they getting their technologies together? Resources, are they well-funded to unfunded? Uh, usually looking at tools and tactics provide that insight, right? Risk tolerance, uh, teenagers tend to not care uh, and be a little bit more self-destructive. This is why you have such a uh, influx of DDoS and swatting and, and, and bomb threats that are out there. It's usually, if you look at the stats, they're actually all uh, under the age of 22, 21. Um, and then to low, they never want to be caught, which you'll see higher into obviously nation state and a few other things, right? Um, skills and methods, uh, how sophisticated are the exploits? Are they from scripting to, uh, you know, hardware lifecycle attacks? I mean, uh, again, RSA breach was a very sophisticated, but we also see unsophisticated pay $5 and DDoS a site and it goes down, but um, you know, uh, it's still doable and still can be posing a threat or a risk. Uh, actions, were they well rehearsed, ad hoc, random, controlled versus uncontrolled? Uh, these are, do matter. This tells you where to look. For instance, if I see a DDoS or a swatting of Brian Krebs, I know I'm going to start do, you know, putting this down and say, well, where are the actions? They seem impulsive, this and that. What is, and I start putting all these indicators together and I say, I see a teenager. Okay, where do they hang out? Hack forums. Okay, let's start there. Right? So you know which forum to kind of get into. Attack origination points is important. Numbers involved in the attack themselves. Is it a solo, is it a small group, big group? And the knowledge source, and that's exactly where we're getting. Is are they on forums? Are they, you know, trading in insider knowledge? Are they, is it web, oral, espionage, things like this. Um, I'm going to get into some fun technical. We're going to talk about like doing uh, Tor use case. Uh, actually, how to do onion site crawling, like how to pick up onion sites um, uh, predictively, basically as they come out. Uh, one technique, um, is using, there's Tor to web type services out there, such as an onion link, dot onion, uh, I think it's dot onion dot link or onion dot link or something like that. Um, and so they allow you to search in there uh, in, in, and look for Tor sites and then you can click on them and go through it without having a Tor browser or a Tor setup. It can, it'll take you as a proxy because they have their own Tor setup. Um, so we wanted to use uh, that. Uh, we kind of take advantage of what's called passive DNS monitoring. With passive DNS, for those who may not know, is an archive of all of the historical uh, requests on the internet for DNS. It's, it's anonymized, so we don't see who's making the request, but we get a history of the IP changes and, and, and uh, how much traffic and, and stuff based off sensors around the world. Uh, a lot of the people that host passive DNS are, host also the froot and root servers, so they get a lot of this data and it's, it's very helpful for spotting new activity that's, uh, that's coming out such as botnets, dynamic DNS, and Tor. So uh, again, this is a sample set. You're not going to be able to see everything, but passive DNS monitoring gives you real-time insight on some things. So it would look like this. So I would do a start at onion.link. The way the onion.link does is it takes its onion site and it puts a dot, it takes that, uh, the, the, the basically the, the um, subdomain and puts it dot onion.link. So whatever the site's called, it'll come up. So if I hit start at onion.link and I, you know, I did the, this, uh, Let's research snapshot from last year, but basically, if it was for today, I would get all this information for today and, and tell me what was the newest thing that I saw, right? And how long it's been around, things like that. So um, at this time, I know at, at the time that this was done, I know that I can find 7,924 onion sites already just from doing this uh, quick command, uh, basically looking for wildcard uh, of anything that's uh, dot on onion.link, right? This allows me to have strong collections, um, you know, um, and then from here, I can also basically do all of that uh, from building this down. So we can basically do this to Tor to web, you can do it to uh, Onion Link, you can do it to dynamic DNS server providers, you can do it to a lot of different things, getting a lot of information, right? So in this case, look, the, the useful information I got here right here is already here. I also get hit counts, so it gives me an idea of how many times, how popular it is, 
we basically I can view by popularity. Um, so Vault 43 is one of the top ones. Um, and this kind of gives me an idea also how to classify what kind of traffic. I mean, over time I can also find out kind of things like this. Using the sample set, I was able to say, okay, I want all of 2011 hits, um, you know, from to 2015. This was uh, a trends I was doing report. So from that statistics from the, uh, those five years, we can see a big uptick in unique hidden service onion sites that are requested. So for those who actually don't know, onion sites are these hidden services. They're like just a new domain, but they're within Tor. And they host sites and they don't have IP addresses tied to them uh, uh, on Tor, but they're tied underneath, they, but they're hiding those IP addresses, right? So we are seeing a big uptick in, in hidden services. From 2014 to 2015 alone, there was a 24% increase uh, of unique onion sites. Uh, and then when you look at the 2015 expect, expect term, you see August had a great big uh, push up. It could have been summer, but it also, there was a big takedown by the FBI of a big forum that was not on tour called uh, Dark Code in July. And so uh, what could have also led to that is more people going over because uh, that announcement, media does affect uh, action. And so maybe there was also an uptick there. Again, I'm, con uh, I'm making a conjecture here, but it's something interesting to look at when you look at the data sets. Uh, and you can also compare it to what happened in the deep dark forums, what's the conversation, things, things like that. Um, other things that have concern when you look at your enterprise and stuff, de doxing. Doxing is the weapon of precision and it's, uh, it's basically, um, it's the idea of posting all your information all over the internet. Everything you're private, everything about your family. It's a very, you can't, once it's done, it's very hard to undo. Uh, it's very hard to prevent, and there's everybody on the internet. You, you get crazy, so you don't know if you're going to get harassed by whoever. So once they put that information out there, not only hackers, but I mean, it just could be someone that's like, I'm bored today, right? Uh, the nightmare itself can be very kinetic, swatting, harassment, bomb threats. You can get a pile of dump, uh, dump truck of rocks in your garage just sent to you. Uh, I mean, you could get pizza ordered every night that you didn't pay for. I mean, they could just, you know, or didn't ask for. I mean, it could be a constant thing. Uh, it will be a weapon worn well by retaliation-focused actors. So when I think about uh, retaliation, I think of hacktivists that feel like we're interfering or we got in the media and talked about them, things like that. Uh, we've seen this many times. Um, so also, another thing, anonymous zero knowledge currencies. So, so anonymous uh, networks, I2P um, uh, and Tor, um, for those who don't know, I was actually the founder of I2P, so I have a, you know, a, a bit of my hand in the privacy side of, uh, of things as well. Um, the, 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 the evolution there is they're becoming more well known. Tor obviously is hosting behind the shadows, more OPSEC increased by behavior threat actors. They're, they're the more uh, you know, these takedowns do happen or the more people talk in the media about these hackers and stuff and more dreams attention, these, these, the bad guys are thinking about OPSEC because they realize it's going to get media attention. I've got to be able to, to make sure that they, no one can find me because now the entire world is looking at what I did. Uh, and also we're seeing anonymous zero knowledge cur cur currency that was it's designed called ZeroCoin, also designed by Zero Cash. It's very impressive from a cryptographic perspective. Uh, it will probably uh, be very, very hard to trace. Uh, and so, again, it doesn't mean it's bad use, but uh, we're going to see how it looks. But, you know, obviously if it, it, it grows in volume and value, uh, obviously we'll probably see more use of it from the, the, the dark side of the web as well. Another quick trend that we're seeing, uh, mobile to host malware scenario, two-factor uh, authentication is increasing, uh, increasing. As you've seen, uh, Gmail has it, face, uh, I don't know Facebook, but LinkedIn, a lot of players are uh, implementing it now. Or they're implementing it where there's no password and it's just a, basically a, a token into your email um, or your phone, uh, which is basically uh, you know, one factor or just an uh, out-of-band factor. So in that case though, your phone if you've noticed when you log into stuff, it gets you right into it because your phone is the factor. So what we're seeing, uh, a trend that we're predicting here is a two-factor increasing the mobile devices for authentication and out-of-band will cause an adaptation for adversaries to tailor host their base malware to cross-infect. So if they get on your computer and you plug your phone in, it may cross-infect to mobile devices to complete authentication case census, uh, sessions. They want the crown jewels. So hacking your phone will cause an increase in mobile malware. So. Um, so basically, just for defeating authentication mechanisms, that's going to be a big play, right? Um, so uh, that's something to keep an eye out on um, from the, there. And uh, another one is privacy versus intelligence. We are in an election season, uh, which is basically a performance review by the people of America to, to the government of the United States and all the people that are running it. Um, so in that sense, um, uh, a lot of things that come up to the media or get pushed on are hot topics. And one of the hot topics that we saw last year and this year 
covered by, I think, the presidential candidates was privacy versus intelligence. You know, the Apple FBI issue, the, the scenarios are coming up and creeping it up. Even though this war was fought in the 90s and the tools are already there, uh, and there is no likely prevention of uh, anything po politically that could happen there. But um, the government's pushing for this, and so it's causing this attention, this key escrow back doors in crypto. This argument's coming up again. There's a, a slight effect here that actually, from a, a political perspective, that will cause uh, awareness. The cypherpunk community privacy tools are going to then become more popular. It's, it's actually not in the best interest to be pushing against this because it's only drawing attention to this. Now you've heard of tools like Wicker, Signal, Telegram on news stations such as CNN, NBC, uh, and, and all the bigger uh, networks now. It's not like it's an unknown tool. They're getting a lot of press um, saying that, you know, uh, we're scared of these tools, we're concerned with these tools. So with that, the cyberpunk community finally has a voice, Tor, ITP, Signal, Telegram, all of these communications. Um, Apple even increasing its encryption and stuff. Adversaries become more aware of these anti-backdoor protocols embedded by the cypherpunk community. And the effect is that the cypherpunks in, 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 in unintentionally arm cyber criminals with privacy tools, increasing their OPSEC and anonymity, anonymity against hunters. So in a way, I, as much as we're fighting for it on the, the political side, it's actually causing the problem. So it's kind of one of those, like, it's going to hurt us because we're going to only be reactive and it's only causing more awareness to, to the adversaries in the other end. So that's something to, to, to consider. Um, on a fight for that on the intelligence side, we have a lot of other data to gather. Encryption is not everything in that sense. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that can be uh, siphoned that uh, they use that uh, you know, uh, gives you a lot of attribution or intelligence information about what they're doing, not, you know, not just the words that they're using inside of an encrypted chat. Um, and that is the conclusion to uh, my uh, talk on the deep dark web. Uh, I, uh, I am ready for questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> oh, th thanks, Lance. That was a uh, uh, very interesting presentation. It's, uh, uh, it's an interesting topic, you know, the uh, the dark web. It's, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of us may not know the details of it, so it's it's nice to get a, a little bit more insight into it. So, the, uh, uh, you know, I guess one of the questions I have is, you know, is it Primarily, you know, an environment that's used by, you know, let's you just use the term bad guys, you know, the the, the criminals, the, uh, you know, f folks that are looking out to do negative things, or, or are there any, you know, folks that are using it to try and do some more um, positive or constructive things? Uh, do you, uh, what's your, what's, what's your insight into, into that uh, area? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so actually, ironically, we wrote about this in our trends report in, uh, last year. Uh, for the French side of, of, of the, the deep and dark web uh, community, and they were complaining that the badness that is going on uh, that is causing the deep and dark web to get a bad rap uh, in that sense, right? And they were upset because the bad guys are kind of ruining the good things that people are doing in the same kind of forums and, and things like this. And so, uh, you know, those people are more like privacy advocates and things like that in Europe. Uh, and, you know, maybe probably a little bit on the edge, but uh, not going out of their way to try to break the law or, you know, rob people or, or do criminal actions. Um, there is a big question there is how much uh, of this is bad. Um, it all really kind of how, how does you look at it, because we, we look at bad on purpose, obviously, because we're, we're, we're designed to do that, right? And we see negative first and, and just as humans. But on the other side of it, uh, how many forums are out there in the world? That there's a lot more forums in the, in the real world that aren't bad. There's motorcycle forums. There's, you know, um, there's things about art and, and quilts and things like this. And people, people build forums for a lot of things. The attention in the deep and dark web, I mean, we don't consider that deep and dark web because they're password protected or this and that. But there are memberships out there that, you know, might be, you know, not bad, like Freemasons or this or that, that you know, behind those kind of things or whatever. Like those kind of forums will probably have password protection or membership communities. Uh, things like that. Um, so it's kind of interesting how we classify what the deep and dark web is in that way. Um, what we do specifically look at is the ones that are hidden by passwords focused on bad, badness and focused on carding and forms. Uh, but I, I would be careful to say that the deep web and dark web are necessarily the deep and dark because they're bad, more that they're just not accessible to the common internet. So I, in the truth, um, you're going to probably have more good than bad in the, in the reality. We are looking at the bad because that's, that's our job, and, and we want to make sure that the, the bad stays less than the good. So, Great. Thanks. That's, uh, yeah, that's interesting. I think, uh, yeah, 
probably not unlike the media. You know, a lot a lot of times we hear the uh, you know all the negative stuff. You you know, we get, hear about the bad things that are going around and in the world, but they don't necessarily, you know, tell us about the good things that are happening. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, the bad things sell more, uh, <laughs> more advertising. So, yeah, we're always um, missing the good variable. The good variable is always out of the question when it comes to looking at the stuff. And that, that is true. So, <clears throat> okay. So one of our, one of our attendees had a question about, uh, you know, you're talking about the, uh, you know, the folks in the dark web put up their platforms and, and, you know, we put up ours as well. Uh, now they kind of noted that, they they were probably more agile, uh, and from a uh, you know you know looking at the current DoD processes, uh, you know the the defense against that, um, you know are are we always going to be kind of one step behind? You know are, are the folks on the uh, you know on the web developing new tools and methods uh, you know quicker than than we'll be able to uh, to stay on top of? Uh, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. And, and it's really an issue of field of view. Um, so I compare it to the old school days, like the Renaissance days when castles were the big thing uh, and bow and arrows were the way to fight wars and, and, you know, axes and hammers and stuff. And, and the castles were the biggest, you know, we were the castles, right? And then the introduction of gunpowder came in, and that changed everything for castles, meaning that view that we were in as a castle, that shift, we're in that shift right now, that, that, that when they had to go, uh-oh, our castles are getting blown down by cannons and things like this and gunpowder. And uh, that's all new to us in, in, from a generational perspective. And the adjustment period is what we're in right now. Um, and we saw, for instance, even the last few years, a ton of major breaches that were very eye-opening you know, uh, um, eye for us. Um, but we do have to think more agile. Now, I mean, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, I mean, once you're a government that's set up this way or you're an enterprise set up this way, it's very difficult. But I mean, I always look at it as if we can think agile, we go iterative, right? Meaning. We, we, you know, I've seen a lot of people that they, they do, we, we talk about the checkbox, we talk about the risk compliance, all this stuff, um, and it's very difficult to get out of that mode, but that's what the capital is, the risk box. We, we were good, we're, this worked, this worked for years, we're good. Now we have to start looking at iteratively, okay, well, now we have to look at a castle and do we need to do some extra things? Do we need to put some guards up front? Do we need to have them like in front and like ready to flank people that even get near our castles? Do we need to have guerrilla tactics to basically make sure no one can, you know, we attack the, the fighters from behind to that have a cannon and they didn't even know we were there? I mean, th it is, it, and that's standard warfare analogy here, but I mean, it, it really is like uh, we have to start iteratively breaking down what is exposing us? Basically, I look at it as we break it down to what's the information that we have, wh what are the secrets and who, where are they, and who are the actors involved, which is yourself, your clients, and, and the bad guys, and, and other things, and uh, stupid mistakes, things like that, something that leaked something by accident, things, all of these things. And so when you bring up build out a threat model, we just kind of have to, like, it has to be less paperwork and actually, like, realistic these days. And when I say realistic, it means... Uh, small groups of people kind of get together and actually start tackling those iterative issues across the that. And it sounds easier than done, um, but it's, it's going to be an uphill battle. We are in that adjustment phase. Um, we are like sitting like bird's eye view to, to, a, to a, a bird's eye view to a castle to a helicopter Apache with a missile pointing at us. That's what we look like right now. But um, <clears throat> you know, we have to kind of think, think about uh, how do we how do we build a defense system that when helicopters came out, how do we how do we counter that? Well, we have uh, air to ground missiles, things like that. So we we just got to start thinking about it in that way, more of an iterative uh, process, break it down, start building out, and 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 thinking about attack surface reduction. Uh, you will get hit, but if you're isolated or or they can't get anywhere, that's that's one of the biggest ones that you want to you know kind of start focusing around. If I can give anybody a hint, so. <clears throat> Okay. Um, yeah, I guess. So I guess, yeah, I guess one of the things you kind of showed that uh, you kind of showed that intelligence uh, cycle chart. You know, starting starting with the requirements and ending with the uh, dissemination, and you know, then feed, feeding back again. So it seems like maybe you know one of the, one of the things we need to be doing, uh, you know, is kind of that intelligence surveillance reconnaissance uh, activity. Uh, you know, trying to see what's going on out there and. Um, you know, in order, you know, so maybe on our side, we become more proactive, you know, instead of instead of just being in that reactive state, we become more proactive and can, you know, defend ourselves better and, you know, try and try and keep uh, try and keep in step with them, at least maybe. Yeah, it's what I call being yeah preemptive. It's, it's unfortunately because of where we're at now, it's more expensive than the cost of them attacking us. It's just it, that's the sad part about it all of it. 
Uh, but hopefully in time it, it'll get less expensive and this becomes more of a commonplace security. It's just a commonplace thought versus an afterthought. We're getting there. Uh, I have a lot of faith in where we're going. It's just, it's tough to imagine the internet in 15 years. I know that, but um, you know, I, you know, I, I think also in some senses we've had some leaps and strides, uh, and, and most of the technologies out there are available. It's just now implementing them. They, it's not like they haven't been around. It's just, you know, getting through the inconvenience of actually doing it. So. Yep. Okay. Let's see. We have a, another question from the audience uh, in, uh, having to do with ransomware, and uh, you know when uh, you know when the lockout actually occurs. Uh, somebody uh, they were they're wondering if uh, u utilizing the cloud, uh, you know, cloud computing technology would be um, you know helpful in um, in uh, you know preventing uh, these uh, ransomware uh, attacks. Um, I think anytime. Um I mean, obviously, if you think about it from a, the, when people ask me about ransomware, I just say backup, 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 and not on the same computer, obviously, right? Um, but the cloud is obviously definitely something that will play very difficult. We also have seen server-side ransomware, like the ones that are kind of like not ransomware anymore. It's more like uh, ransom network, like, you know, they're trying to hold ho networks hostage. Uh, that said, cloud is obviously, you know, you can use the cloud for backups. You can use, I mean, it's really about distributed, you know, data sets, right? You don't want your data all in one place. Uh, you don't want to have it where they can't hold it for hostage. Uh, it's, it's, I think of it as kind of like a, a safety deposit in a bank. The things that you really care about are not near you, uh, but you can get access to them, right? Um, so in that way, the cloud can be set up in that way. That would probably reduce uh, that attack surface for you. Um, uh, and, 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 and also on the other side of it, um, there are like things like OpenStack and things like that that can, you can build out your own container systems and things like this so that you can limit uh, the application or use of, uh, of something uh, kind of thin client style so that you reduce it as well so that if it is ransomware, there was no storage there on the system. I mean, it's really kind of building out like on an enterprise network to, to prevent ransomware. You would want to build out storage networks and have thin clients to really reduce that problem because then there's nothing to encrypt other than the system files and that can be wiped away immediately and re-imaged. Re so, so yeah, I agree that basically thinking about like where to get distance the data from the problem, where the, where the target is. That, that's the key. So, so yeah, I agree that that could definitely be, depending on how it's done, I definitely think it could uh, be very helpful. So. Okay. So it's, uh, it's kind of the, uh, you know, protect the, protect the crown jewels and, uh, you know, try and, try and lock those up as uh, safely as possible. And, and like you yeah, said. And distance, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, distance, your, the distance, the, the exposure. So like, it's like, think of it this way, ransomware is coming in into attack a desktop. Should that desktop be having the highest risk and should it not be, you know what I mean? Like you want to distance that. I mean, it is becoming one of the most common places. I mean, you're, you're going you're gonna to hear more and more from the media. Oh my gosh, this big place got hit. This big place got hit. All it takes is one time and it's got hit. And some of them are wormish, so they'll just pass right through and it just... You know, and it's usually getting in on HR and finance or, or, or anything that's wanting, you know, needs incoming in emails and things like that. I mean, unfortunately, your business, the highest number, you know, most used business tool is email. People are moving on the go. They don't have time to stop thinking about it. And they, some of them look very realistic. Um, so, yeah, you want to basically just make sure that your data is in the right spot that is not a concern and distance yourself from that, uh, distance your data from that threat. So, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, here's a, another uh, question from uh, from one of our attendees. Uh, it says, to to determine how to increase your security, it may help to know what is already out there. How are organizations searching for what data or assets they have lost to the dark web already, or or is this something that is uh, not currently being considered? Oh, it's very much considered. Um, so, well, I mean, and I don't want to push us as well, but we, we, I mean, one of the things we are is a search engine to the dark web, but um, I can say from experience that that is one of the primary uses of our, you know, what we do is one, either alerting on any kind of like, you know, is there our data out there, right? Or, you know, they, they're kind of looking, that's all, that's their biggest thing. Uh, from a, a tactical uh, advantage, uh, that's kind of what we get employed to is keep an eye on all of that stuff out there for them. So yeah, looking for their data out there is, is Probably one of their on their highest uh, highest priority tactical priority lists. Yes. So. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see another another uh, question from the uh, the audience here. Does uh, does the uh, adversaries purchase their hot points uh, systems in in other multi in other or multiple countries, uh, or do they uh, uh, 
compromise systems on their own. Com compromise systems on their own. Oh, I see, I see what you're saying. It's actually almost if, uh, it depends on the adversary. Uh, I see I see personally see a mix of it. So there, there are a lot of people that are commonly doing the, the, the bad guy stuff, uh, not always, it depends on the type of business they're doing, but a lot of them just set up unattrib type networks such as VPN, Tor, uh, and go through proxies all over the world. Um, and they'll rent out maybe hack boxes when they may not know or they are hack boxes, but there'll also be people who rent out hack boxes for that reason, uh, their go through boxes or pass through boxes. So it's a mix of that. How you want your unattrib network can be down to the level of a full hack network down uh, up to I paid for everything just as a standard service and it's, it's pretty basic, right? So uh, definitely a, a heterogeneous and genius uh, mix there, so. <clears throat> Another question was uh, uh, folks uh, Folks are saying that the majority of the cybersecurity tools out there tend to be uh, passive. Uh, are there any tools out there uh, that are, you know, more active, uh, you know, that are more active security oriented that you uh, may recommend to, to utilize? Um, defining active, uh, when you think passive, I, is there a way to get a clarification on that question? <clears throat> Uh, is the uh, individual that asked that question uh, able to uh, specify that a little bit in more detail? Uh, we'll 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 go to another question. Um, uh, somebody was asking about uh, they've they've got uh, you know um, a lots of, many passwords for for numerous accounts and uh, you know I think that's becoming kind of an overwhelming you know. Uh, situation for them and trying to handle that. Uh, you're just curious about, you know, kind of what what do you do to, uh, you know, manage all the uh, uh, various passwords you have for different systems and applications that, uh, you know, you're using? Um, for our, our end for managing, just to clarify, so at the beginning of the question was about managing passwords in general or managing passwords on the dark web and how, how to get on there and, and, and personas and such. I, I think I think that one was I think in general I think that was just oh uh, yeah. oh um, well password management I mean it can be done singly as an individual as well as all the way upward um, obviously just you know I, a lot of that's just standard good hygiene hygiene um, I don't know if this is a I'm right answering the right way for for this just make, making sure I understand but um, uh, you know uh, basically good you know. I, one of the biggest biggest problems we see in the underground is password reuse. This is why data dumps are so popular. For instance, the LinkedIn data dump isn't about LinkedIn. It's about the data, the password you have in another account that was on it. You may have passed, changed your password on LinkedIn, but you probably didn't change it. Uh, if, it's, if there's another account out there that's using that password and it is you know, something they cracked, they're going to figure it out and reuse it, and they're going to go after it, right? And so that's the value here is the mass scale, the, the mass distributed scale to the access they have. It's one to many, right? So you have to kind of think about that way, and it sucks from a man. It's, it's very hard from a management perspective because you're like, oh my gosh, yet another password, yet another password, yet another password. I, I just want to use the same thing. Very easy, path of least resistance. We want to do it. I want to do it. You know, um, it is inconvenient. But uh, good password tools out there, like keyword man uh, password managers, are ideal because they can help you generate secure passwords based on NIST standards, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, things like one password, key pass, um, and you have to make a decision. Do you want your passwords in the cloud? I personally don't, so I don't. Um, but some technologies out there also encrypted in the cloud. So if you feel like you know you need to go on the go and you have to have your passwords there, um, so on an individual level, that's the way to do it. Um, on the the corporate level, that's very dependent on obviously the corporate level, uh, corporate environment. Um, most of the technologies are out there that do it. I'd like to see it implemented more, but it also comes down to inconvenience. Um, I, I had an idea on a while ago about a password management protocol research project that could allow people to figure out how to, to devise or force the, the individual to want to, to get more into passwords. Uh, the idea was um, let them have a bad password uh, and just reset it three day, every three days, they'll learn. And the idea is after a while you, have, you present with them uh, the ability to, to read about why we want you to have a good password versus telling people they want a good password. Because I think a lot of this is also a psychological uh, can, uh, you know, kind of basically induct, uh, in, uh, cognitive induction. You got to, you know, you got to get someone engaged to, to to understand why. And we've been doing a lot of negative reinforcement, uh, and and not thinking about like you know positive and negative. And so the idea was to gamify like the research and say, oh well, if we use different ways to get people to change their password or or pick better passwords. And then honestly, in in this world, I believe passphrases are probably where we need to start getting if we're going to even be using passwords. 
So that, that's where that's going. Um, and so, so basically to answer your question, it's a lot of it's just on the individual and, and you got to just kind of think about it from a, a hygiene perspective. So. <clears throat> So I guess it's kind of a situation where we've got uh, too many sticks and uh, not enough carrots. Huh? Correct. Yeah. So, uh, okay, we did we did get uh, some more uh, some more uh, info to try to clarify the passive versus active. So it says uh, uh, active is identifying a threat and having a tool to prevent that IP from ah, your gotcha. network or sending a damaging tool that uh, adversary offensive attack. Um, also prevent an attack without previous attack with, within the network. So if that if that helps. Uh, if, yeah, so that's a combination of, I, I, yeah, so that's why I very specifically asked what active means. Um, uh, hacking back or active response, things like that, is a very touchy subject for uh, people that are not uh, under the oversight of law enforcement or an intelligence agency. Um, there are techniques and clever things that I consider that are countermeasures that can help you. For instance, we did some research years ago on Dirt Jumper, and we came up with a way that we figured out how to stall or make the D this is a DDoS botnet that was just plaguing banks, and we made a way to if the bank changed uh, the way they they parsed um, the the way that they had a redirect to their to their site, it would actually stop the DDoS. It would literally stall and, and tar pit the, the the DDoS botnet. It would do exactly the opposite, but it did not cause any damage. And it was it was not sending any packets over that anything that wasn't requested. It wasn't like you know you know getting on the system. I mean, you, you wait. You, that's a very that's an entire talk in itself to answer this question. On the active side, I mean, you can also obviously IPS and things like that, and you can instigate those to kind of block. But I mean, I, I, I that that um, I, I always recommend that one is a very very tough one to to just do it because you don't want to trust a machine to attack back. What if they frame another machine? What if this and that? There's also issues with uh, international affairs and escalations. If you start attacking back in, in to Russia or China, do, you know how are they going to perceive that? Do they perceive it as a military attack? Do they perceive it as a corporate attack? How, do, how does all that change everything? So that's a big game changer. Not not saying that that's not something to be into looking into and studying, but it's not something I think that uh, could be solved or is wise at this time for corporations just to pick up and do. So, uh, and I don't think any corporation out there is going to do that from a liability perspective. Um, so. <clears throat> Okay. Well, uh, thanks for thanks for uh, taking uh, uh, answering that question, and I, I think we've kind of uh, run through all the questions uh, from our attendees, and uh, it looks like we're at the uh, at the end of our time for uh, for today. So, Lance, I want to uh, thank you for uh, you know uh, doing the presentation for us. It's uh, a very interesting topic. It was uh, very informative, and uh, we. we Appreciate your uh, your time and sharing your information and knowledge with us. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Well, thanks, folks, and we'll uh, hope to see you next month. Have a good day. Bye-bye.